Now, so leading up to the conference, we'll be profiling the ANC presidential candidates, so picking their brains on the issues that plague the party and ultimately what change they could possibly bring to the party and the country. So today, my colleague Cindy Siwe Twala spoke to ANC presidential candidate Matthews Posa. Let's watch what Posa had to say. Today we speak to Matthew Posa, a man that has dedicated 50 years of his life to the African National Congress, the first Mpumalanga Premier and a Treasurer General from the period of 2007 to 2012. We know that the 54th National Conference of the African National Congress is well on its way and different branches are beginning to name people they would like to be presidents going into the elective conference. We know that uh, Mr. Matthew Posa Dr. Matthew Posa, to be precise, has been named as one of the seven candidates going in. A very, very good day to you and welcome to ANC Decides. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk to you. And I hope your viewers will be part of this engagement. I've been a member of the ANC for slightly more than 50 years, but uh, it's been uh, years I will never replace with anything. And then looking at the organization from when you started to now, uh, how different has it evolved? Well, when some of us, which were many, joined the NEC in the underground, when it was still banned and it was not fashionable to wear an NEC t-shirt, the price was prison, sometimes death, and we did all those things, we were young. And it was an underground struggle where we did political work promote the ideas of the NC, as instructed by the head office in Lusaka, as instructed by every resolution of the party to create a new South Africa. But we had to create awareness, which was in the underground, to produce a democratic South Africa. Where we are now, the challenge is, how do we protect this constitutional state? How do we protect this democracy? I, am, I don't regret anything, because we have a constitutional state. We have a, a Bill of Rights, which we didn't have, we have a uh, rule of law, we have very reliable courts, we have a cabinet, we have uh, provincial governments, we have municipalities which did not exist in the form they are now, very democratically elected. What we did not have at the beginning is corrupt politicians, which we have now. We didn't have politicians in 94 who were stealing from the, their own people, which we have now. That makes you regret a bit, but it doesn't make you give up. It makes you want to engage these corrupt elements, these looters, and say to them, we'll investigate you. If we find that you stole money, we'll prosecute you. If the judges find that you must go to jail, we'll send you to jail. That is the challenge of today. Rather than waste your time regretting, take on the looters, take on the corrupt people, and put them where they belong, in jail, and clean up the ANC and clean up the government. That will require political will and political leadership, which is lacking at the moment. It is lacking because when the Constitutional Court pronounced on our president and said, you have violated your oath of office, you have virtually violated the Constitution, the ANC should not have done what it did at the NEC level. Which is? Take collective responsibility for the wrong of an individual. The ANC should have had a moral authority to say, Mr. President, resign on your own or we will dismiss you. But the NEC did the opposite. It says we take collective responsibility. You know what that means? If you are complicit to corruption, you're corrupt yourself. That's why I've been making statements. We look like we're corrupt ourselves because there were acts of corruption around in Gantle, and we don't want to go into those details now. But if you protect me and promote corrupt people, which is what we're doing, Look, take uh, Faith Mutambe. She messes up at SABC. What do we do? We promote her sideways. We protect her. I'm giving you as an example. 300,000 of uh, the taxpayers' money spent on her relatives. We still protect her. So we're seen as protecting and promoting the corrupt. What is our interest in that corruption? The public is asking. And in the process, the public loses faith in the African National Congress. Mm. It loses trust in us. We end trust 
as political parties, as leaders. We don't deserve it, but we earn it through our conduct, through our act of commission or omission. We earn trust or we lose it. All right, and then coming back to your campaign, which is one of the reasons we are speaking to you, we know that you've accepted nomination from Ward 52, and that particular branch has come out saying that the organization is in tatters, something you've also reiterated, that the organization is in tatters, and they want someone with, um, with authority and someone with dignity to take the organization forward. Um, how, why exactly did you accept this particular nomination? You see, at that time, what was happening, the various branches were indicating their intentions to nominate. The, the process of nomination is starting now, actual nomination. And as we sit here, I think most of us have been nominated. Because we have indicated to the grassroots that we will accept if we are nominated. And, uh, you know, the leadership gave uh, the branches an opportunity to think about all of us and to debate us. And I think it's the right thing to do. I compliment the leadership for doing that. To say, Comrade Posa, has got the following strengths and weaknesses. We don't think he qualifies to be president. Or we think he's got so many strength, strong points. He qualifies. It's for the branch to decide that issue. Only the branches. You know, the ANC has got a slogan that said, Amanda Asama Sebein. The source of power is the branch. They must decide. And I'm happy to be abide by the judgment of the branches. And I think all the candidates must accept that. If we are elected, in our campaign, we must accept it with humility. If we are not, we must fall on our, our swords. Because we politicians, you live by the sword, you die by the sword. You can't be sniveling like a baby, say I lost. And then, do you, are you anticipating any nomination from Pumalang? Yes, in Pumalang it's getting even more exciting. This morning I was sitting with my provincial coordinator of the campaign. I mean, it's a bloody beautiful picture of, uh, of uh, <laughs> <laughs> nominations across Pumalang. You see, our campaign in Pumalang has deliberately been twisted more in underground because there's been killings, there's been attacks of public meetings where I was supposed to address a George Lower lecture and it was, a, it was done in public, daylight. Comrades were attacked until today that report has not come out from the NEC. People could have been injured that attack. When was this? Late, late last year, so Joe Slover lecture which was disrupted by the hooligans and drunk people. So we said rather than expose our forces to this type of criminality. Let's campaign differently in a more sophisticated way. And I think it's going to be interesting surprises. All right. And then aren't you at all um, concerned looking at your relationship with the current ANC chairperson in the province? Because we know that at the previous Mangawu, there were 500 delegates of which 4,500 in total from the African National Congress, but 500 came from Pumalang, which brought the fourth largest significant number. Aren't you scared that there might be intimidation from the top? I think there's intimidation already. In the reports we got someone, one of my coordinators who spoke in the meeting last week was told, no, no, ufe. it's better if you die. That's intimidation. You don't say that to someone in the NC meeting, but we're not going to be scared of anybody. The branches are not scared. They're going to nominate in Mpumalang and in all provinces. I don't worry about the chairperson of Pumalang at the moment. He's on his way out. The branches will be there when he's not there. So it's not even about him. Where is he going? Well, you can only uh, serve if you are elected as premier, I'm seeing, or elected as chairman. So I assume that he's not going to be how hungry because I see his name at the top. So I think, I don't know where. I don't know if he knows his destination as well. All right, and then in other parts of the country, has your campaign been well received? Very well. I mean, they are surprised by the Eastern Cape, Limpopo. Northwest, Gauteng, where we were with uh, some of you recently. It's all over. And you don't focus where you don't have uh, potential, waste your resources, your time. You focus where you could potential and swing things more and more in your favor, you know, and make others realize you're here. And speaking policy in the ANC, as well as sloganeering and terms that have been coming out, from your point of view, radical, transfer, radical economic transformation or inclusive growth? I don't in intend to engage in theoretical absurdities. Radical economic transformation actually means radical economic looting, stealing, thieving. That's what it means. It has no content in it, in economics. Okay. It doesn't have. If you say you want to transform the economy and include as many possible people as possible, yes, it makes sense. But what is radical about it? 
That's why we should be standing for every day and making sure that the mainstream of the economy is joined by many black people because they've been on the outside of the mainstream of the economy. I think we should allow majority of black people to participate in the economy in an unemotional or populist way. You know, let's not romanticize about economic concepts. So which of the two would work for you or neither? I'm saying we need a, a transformation of the economy. But not under radical economic transformation. Because it doesn't mean anything to me. I see my colleague repeat it, but in, in economic theory and science, it doesn't mean anything. It's empty. It has no content. It's like a white monopoly capital. It is capital. Whether it's white or black, it is capital. And then looking at the system or the, um, the, 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 the political content that the country comes out, out of, doesn't that give it a raise? What? White monopoly capital? If I have money, black. Does, is that money black or white? It's black. Why, why is it black? It's money. Money is colorless. Money is money. You could easily have a black class of people here who own all the economy. Are you going to call it what? It's capitalism. From a Marxist Leninist studies, it's capitalism. Even from the, the Western theories of isms of that nature, it remains capitalism. And then if somebody's sitting at home that is going to be voting under the ANC, one of the delegates, what is it that is different from you, from the other candidates that you offer? Some of the candidates have now condemned corruption. And you can check what they've been saying. They have never once condemned corruption. Because why? Because in some cases you know what the relationships are with them and others. So they will never condemn corruption. They never condemn state capture. They behave like it is normal. Other candidates mumble, you know. And I ask them, why do you mumble and fumble? Said, no, I'm still in NEC, you know, if I become too straight, they'll ask me questions in NWC. They are afraid, some of them. There are those who have tried to speak out and appreciate that they do that. I speak straight. I tell the truth, which you don't have to remember, which you know it is the truth. And I say to our people, let us build the economy of this country. Not on slogans, but on real hard considerations and attract investment in this country. But if we don't attract investment, it doesn't matter how many jobs we promise, there will be no jobs. There will be losses of jobs like we have now with the so-called radical economic transformation and we are at 27% unemployment. That's where you are with all the slogans. I don't need slogans. Let's be hard-nosed about the, re the community economic reality and build the economy. Let us fight corruption. Unconditionally fight corruption, in respect of who is involved. Even if they are comrades, we must deal with them. So we must start in the house, so that there's no corruption in the NEC. The NEC uh, restores its moral authority. All right, and then the president has said to unify the slates, like you correctly alluded that they are slates, and it's been out in the open, uh, that the person who does not emerge victorious as president should be the second deputy president and then there should be an enlargement of the top six to possibly a top nine or whatever number. From your view, do you think that that is possible, that a runner-up could accept such a position? Let's put it this way. The president's suggestion on the presidency is unintelligent. Total unintelligent does not make sense because we are seven. And if one or only one can win, so are you going to have six deputy presidents? On his logic, you must have six deputy presidents. But they will have contested the same position. As the, to be deputy, according to his logic, it doesn't make sense. So I think everybody will reject that. The enlarging of the structure and making it large and unwieldy does not solve the problems in the NC. The counter argument of making it lean and mean of, as Lenin said, of professional revolutionaries is the argument I'll, I'll go for. Lean and mean, not to you large and unwieldy and difficult to take decisions or even implement them, if you've taken them. So I think I argue the opposite direction. I think the suggestion that uh, those who lose uh, the contestation of presidency must become deputy president is made ridiculous by the numbers of contestants. And then would you be deputy? Well, I would never go into a campaign to be deputy. So let's leave that hypothetical question out for now. So should it happen? I don't know what's going to happen in the future. I'm running to be the president of the ANC. And that's it. Not even of the country, of the ANC. And I want to focus on that. And that's what my nomination is all about, to be president of the African National Congress. 
I love this movement and I care about it. I love our members. I love South African people. And I think we must not do a disservice to the ANC or to the South Africa itself. And then have you been approached by the other six to possibly come into their camp? Because we know that others have approached others to possibly be their deputies and likewise, so that if I'm president, you might come into play. Have they approached you? More than three have approached me. And I think it's confidential discussions, and we must respect that. And like comrades, we discuss intelligently. My approach is very simple, and I say it to all of them. We need a clean NC as a product, a clean one. It cannot be a clean NC which embraces corruption. It cannot be a clean NC which has got on its list corrupt politicians, thieves. It, can, it cannot produce a clean NC. For me, that is the minimum. The next thing we must agree that we need a clean state, which is respect the constitution and the rule of law. And then we can go have a party. Otherwise. I'm prepared to go to the conference, fight on the shop floor for those values, f win or lose. But if I lose, lose with honor and dignity. And that was Dr. Matthews Posa in conversation with ANN7 Sindisiwe Twala. Interesting interview there. Posa condemning the stance taken by the NEC to take collective responsibility for the Nkanta debacle, also revealing that they're campaigning in his home province of Mpumalanga, although under the radar, and talking of radical economic looting. It is the time for phrases, so there's a new one, R-E-L, radical economic looting. For more, watch the full interview at 8.30 a.m. tomorrow. And that's where we ended. God bless.